Professor Joe Del Santo. Well, thank you, Julie. And good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be back with you here. Even though we can't be together in person, it's always nice to be able to discuss some fascinating topics in astronomy with you. I understand we have probably somewhere around 150 people attending, some from other states. So welcome to all. Tonight we have a fascinating topic. Maybe you've heard about in the news recently, the discovery of gravitational waves. And frankly, this is a topic that is quite momentous. So in order to give you a good understanding of this discovery, I'd like to take an approach that I sometimes do. I'd like to take a few minutes and give you a little bit of historical background so that you have some context with which to understand this discovery. And again, how momentous it really is. So I'd like to cover these four main parts of our discussion tonight, again, to see how our view of the universe has changed over time. Number one, we'll start with some ancient ideas about the universe. And I don't mean necessarily the exact understanding we may have had, but more how we studied the universe, how we looked at it. Then we'll cover the scientific method, perhaps our most powerful method to understand the universe. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about how much we have learned by observing light. That may seem obvious, but I think you'll see it's important to understand how much we've been able to discover and learn about the universe via light, how that has led to our current theories, our current understanding. And then I believe we will be in a good position to fully understand and appreciate, again, this momentous discovery of gravitational waves and how they're changing our view of the universe. You see here an ancient uh, illustration of man's search for knowledge to understand our universe. I think that's just fundamental to all of us. And it's something that will continue to be with us forever, really. Let's go back to ancient philosophers. I can't cover all of them, certainly, but I'd like to highlight a couple here that perhaps you're familiar with Plato and Aristotle. Now, Plato took the approach that the visible material world that you and I see and are familiar with is merely a shadow of the ideal invisible world. And therefore, he tended to shy away from or even spurn experiential learning. Instead, he felt that your senses were fallible. They might lead you astray from this ideal, perfect world that he envisioned. And so he began to emphasize the importance of reasoning from first principles to try to understand rather than the other way around, what we might call empiricism. Well, Aristotle took a little different approach. He was familiar with two different ways of reasoning. Perhaps you've heard of induction and deduction. Induction, as you see here, is really taking specific observations and extrapolating them to come up with general principles. But deduction, which he emphasized, kind of works a little differently. Here you start with certain general premises and you use those to interpret your observations to reach a conclusion about the natural world. So I think you can see the difference there in our little diagram. And because Aristotle did that, for many centuries, his approach was the standard approach to understanding nature. He became revered. Many referred to him in later centuries as the philosopher said this, or the philosopher said that, and they would use that to, again, try to understand the natural world. Unfortunately, that did have the effect of restricting our advances in many areas of understanding the universe. But I guess you have to remember that they really had no technology at their disposal here. And so they took this approach to trying to understand the universe. Well, let's fast forward a number of centuries and we come towards more of the Middle Ages here. I'd like to highlight three particular individuals, as you can see here. Francis Bacon really was one of the first to outspokenly um, really propose empiricism. He felt that truth was not to be found merely through reason and logical argument as the ancient philosophers, but rather, again, through empiricism, through experience, through experiments. He felt that our observations with our senses were trustworthy to understand the world we lived in. 
even if we extended those observations with instruments. Robert Boyle, shortly thereafter, also heavily promoted the importance of instruments and experiments. He was one of the early founding, founding uh, members of the British Royal Society at that time that took this initial investigative type of approach. And shortly thereafter, Robert Hooke, a younger contemporary, has also emphasized the importance of analysis and reasoning on the experiments. In other words, once we observe certain things in nature, we of course could use those to again, learn and draw various principles. So I think you can see here the beginning of a new method of understanding the universe. And gradually this took hold, gradually others began to realize the value of looking at the universe from this perspective. So again, at this point, I think by now you realize that we're describing the early beginnings of science, a scientific approach. So let's take just a couple minutes and look at how science actually works. Over on the right, you can see a number of the steps, but I'll kind of talk through them. Science begins with observations. We go out and we look at the natural world, whatever field we may be interested in, whether it's astronomy or something else. And of course, these need to be something that anyone can do. Repeatable, verifiable facts that we know. Usually, being curious as humans are, this begins to generate questions. Why is it like that? What's causing that? How might I explain that? And so this is the early steps in science. Those facts then are taken and used to perhaps generate what we call a hypothesis or a early explanation, kind of a provisional one, waiting to see if we might prove that correct or not. And often these hypotheses take the form of a model. We come up with a way to, again, explain certain phenomena we might see. I'll use a simple example I sometimes use with my students. If you lived centuries ago and you went outside and looked up and watched the moon, for a number of nights moving through its phases, you might conclude that, well, it seems like perhaps it's going around the earth and the sun is off in the distance illuminating it. From that point forward, we need to know if we're correct or not. Can we explain it? In other words, we must test the hypothesis. We must test the model in some way, depending on whatever we are investigating, Perhaps we devise an experiment. Perhaps we make a prediction to say, well, if my model, my explanation is correct, then I should see this. I should see the moon continue to go through these various phases. I should see that repeat monthly and so on and so forth. If our explanation, our hypothesis is found to be wrong, which is often the case, we may have to just simply discard it and start over. It's very common in science. There's no shame in that, I always say. Scientists do this all the time. But usually, as we develop a number of hypotheses, sooner or later, we're going to find one that does seem to work better. It does pass our tests. So even if we must update, improve, expand our original hypotheses or develop a whole new one at some point, we're going to get one that does explain what we see that is verified by our testing. Here is where we now can begin to call this a theory. So this word theory is used a little differently in science than it maybe is in everyday life. Sometimes if we voice an opinion, someone might say to us, well, that's just your theory. But that's not really how we best use that term in science. I emphasize to my students that a theory must have some support. It must have passed some tests for us to use that term. Now, that doesn't mean that we view it as absolute truth, but instead we continue to test it. And in this way, we learn more. And we use that theory to explain what we understand up to that point in time. So this is how our understanding of the natural world grows. Usually as our theory continues to be tested, we either develop more experiments or make more observations. We continue to learn more and often we are able to improve our theory. 
So this was the method that again took over in the Middle Ages and has served us very well ever since. Today it's followed with great rigor by many scientists throughout the world in many fields. And it has been called sometimes a self-correcting method. In other words, sooner or later, we will arrive at a correct understanding, despite the fact that of course, scientists are imperfect, may even have biases. This methodology can lead us to a correct understanding. Okay, well, now that we understand the methodology, let's take a few more minutes, if you'll indulge me, and see what types of things we've learned in recent centuries by gathering and observing light. This has really been our main way to view the universe. So let's take a look at some of the things there. Light, of course, as you know, is a form of energy. We call it an electromagnetic wave. You probably know that that light can have longer or shorter wavelengths. You see in the picture here, we can break light into different colors, which are of different wavelengths. You see in the diagram below, there's other types of light than visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared light, X-ray light. All of these are utilized today by scientists in many fields, especially astronomy, to observe the universe. So again, you can see my question here, what have we learned? What can we learn by examining light? Well, some things are gonna be pretty obvious, others maybe not so much. Let's take a quick summary of some of those things. First of all, in the early days, again, when we had little technology, people would simply observe with their eyes, perhaps begin making drawings, as you see in my upper left-hand diagram here. And then eventually by the 19th century, when photography was invented, they could take photographs. And today we can take electronic images and store them, transmit them and so forth, enhance them. And so certainly we can learn about the appearance of objects, their structure, we can, by careful use of photographs and images, measure the distance to astronomical objects, a method called parallax. I won't go into that right now. How about simply looking at the brightness of an object? Well, here's where a fundamental law of light can serve us very well. It's called the inverse square law of light. And it basically relates the brightness we see to the distance of the object and its luminosity or the amount of light that it is emitting. We know of course that the farther away an object may be, the dimmer it appears, but how much dimmer? Well, physicists were able to tell us at some point that light diminishes, again, according to an inverse square law. In other words, if the object is twice its original distance, it's not one half the brightness, it would be one fourth the brightness. And if it was moved to three times its original distance, it would be one ninth the brightness. You can see again, we're squaring the distance in the denominator of a equation there. How about spectroscopic analysis? What is that? Well, I've mentioned in other lectures that we of course can take light, break it into a spectrum of light as you see there in the, um, the middle left-hand image. And from that, we can determine a, a lot, especially in astronomy. Number one, we are able to measure the velocity of an object. Number two, it's composition by the pattern of lines, you see. Number three, it's temperature. In fact, we can go on and on, but one of the most, I think, impressive things we've done is we've used spectra of light to not only discover, but to measure the expansion of our universe. So you can see how powerful light is. There's much information contained in the light that we receive from astronomical objects that we can learn. What's photometric monitoring? Well, this basically deals with monitoring the brightness of an object. It may be that the actual star or other object is literally changing its luminosity. It may also be changing its size and its volume. This method has helped us discover the distances to galaxies. It has even helped us find planets around other stars that we cannot even see. Notice in my uh, bottom animation, if you watch closely, a tiny little planet is passing in front of a star. We may not be able to see that planet in most cases, but we can measure the brightness of the star over time. And notice the dip right about there. 
maybe only a very small dip, perhaps only 1% or so, but it's telling us that some small object is blocking a tiny bit of the star's light. And we can then not only detect, but study that planet without ever seeing it. Finally, if we look to the stars, planets, and other objects, we might measure their orbital motions. This has led us to understand their masses, which is vital in astronomy for us to know. It helps us to understand the stars, how they change over time, how they're born, they live, they die. So I think you can start to get a sense here of how much we have learned using light. It has really been the basis, the foundation of so much we've learned about the universe. Okay, well, now that we have a good, again, context, so to speak, let's move on and see how we used all of these discoveries, how we formulated them into, as I said earlier, theories or explanations. Well, after the scientific method had been used for a while, you probably will recognize several of these historical figures who did come up with some of the major theories of our universe. Let's start with my friend Isaac Newton here. Newton had a pretty good idea, a pretty good theory of how the universe works. I say pretty good only because later we found a better one. But at the time, Newton's theory was outstanding. It took all of those observations of his day and it consolidated them and used them to build, as I just said earlier, a wonderful, excellent theory of the universe called the classical theory. And this was, again, an experiential approach to our macroscopic everyday world. We could measure objects. We could make different calculations. For example, Newton, as you see in the upper right here, discovered various laws of motion that we could use to understand what we saw. For example, objects don't just begin moving or stop moving all by themselves, of course. His first law says they stay at rest or they stay in motion unless a force, force acts on them. And you and I are familiar with that, of course. That second law relates the force applied to a body to the acceleration. The third law simply states that every force has an equal and opposite force. These three laws are the foundation of so much that we know about the mechanics, the dynamics of our universe. Of course, you see that on the bottom right, the law of gravity, how important that is in astronomy and many other fields. We can see two masses here, Newton says, they are gonna have an attractive force between them. And that force is dependent on several things. Number one, you see the letter G there, That's a measurement of, well, how strong is the force? But number two, you see M1 times M2. Now, I won't take you into a lot of math here, but you can see it's the product of these two masses that affects the strength of the force. And then finally, we have another inverse square law, just like we did with light. Well, this is the distance between the two objects. In other words, if we measure a certain force between them, but then we double the distance, we essentially put a two in the denominator and square it, and we have one fourth of the strength of the force. Or if it was three times the distance, one ninth, and so on and so forth. So again, you can see how Newton's laws provided us with a mechanistic explanation of the universe. Now it did have its shortcomings. Newton himself admitted that he could not explain how or why gravity was such a mysterious force acting at a distance. He's merely describing how it works here. That would be left to others in the future. Well, the theory was, again, an excellent theory for its time, but by the mid to late 19th century, scientists began noticing some things that eventually culminated in a better theory. And I think you might know where I'm going here. At the turn of the 20th century, Albert Einstein comes on the scene and he has a startling new way to look at the universe, his general relativity theory. This was a little more non-intuitive. We didn't necessarily experience this in everyday life. 
In fact, there were some things in that theory that seemed contrary to everyday experience. And yet that theory has stood the test of time, the various, again, tests and experiments that have been done. Einstein moved past Newton's idea of gravity as a force. He said, I don't need to see it as a force. Instead, he posited that space is curved by matter. It was basically a property of matter to curve space and time. You and I experience the curvature as gravity. And I don't have time, obviously, in this lecture to get into great detail. But what's interesting about this, and some say beautiful about this, is that not only does matter curve space, but then space tells matter how to move. And I think you can see that in my little animation here over on the left, this is an actual three-dimensional view of a massive body in space curving three-dimensional space. Kind of interesting to see it. I had to look a bit to find a nice example of that. So take the example of maybe the Earth orbiting the sun. Newton had said there was this mysterious force. Einstein said, well, it's better to look at it as the sun curving space and the Earth traveling along the curvature. Technically, it's a straight line, but it's in curved space. And therefore, to you and me, it's a curved line. So again, a very different and yet, frankly, a better way to view the universe. We're going to touch on a couple more examples here of how it has explained things that Newton's theory could not explain. So I think you can see, again, how our scientific method, our observations of light in many different ways have been used to build our theories, build our understanding, really build our view of the universe up until now. So let's touch on just a couple of the recent discoveries that relativity has made possible. I've mentioned in other lectures, dark matter is a very important part of modern day astronomy. Here we see a picture of a cluster of galaxies, these bright fuzzy objects here. Most of these are much bigger, more massive even than our Milky Way galaxy. So there's a tremendous amount of mass there. And according to Einstein's theory, that mass is again going to curve space time. Well, if indeed there was some objects behind that cluster in the distance, notice all the way on the right that the light from that object would be curved or bent by the distortion of space time, the curvature of space time caused by these galaxies. And so you and I would see a different view, a very distorted view of those background objects. In fact, if you look back in our main picture, you see those blue streaks of light there. Those are not physical objects. Those are the distorted images of objects behind the galaxy cluster. So when we realize what's happening here, we can use this as a way to understand something that is invisible. In other words, we look at these galaxies and we measure their distances. We measure their brightnesses, and we use that to give us a very good estimate of their masses. But when we use Einstein's theory now to extend our view of the universe here beyond the visible, we begin to realize that the curvature of space there is really due to more matter than we see. We add up what we think the mass should be of all those galaxies, and then we compare that to the matter required to curve space-time, they don't match. There are several times more the amount of matter than is visible. And this is where we have now come to the conclusion that there must be dark matter here. So dark matter is a fascinating mystery. It deserves its own lecture, I suppose. But just to summarize briefly here at the bottom, dark matter does not emit any type of light or absorb any type simply doesn't interact with light. And yet it is, again, several times more prominent or prevalent than visible matter. That makes it the dominant form of gravity in the universe. And not only in today's universe, 
But if we were to look back even to the beginning of the universe, the formation of galaxies, the gravity of dark matter would be predominant here. And even through the evolution and history of the universe. So I think again, you can see we are looking beyond light here necessarily to enhance, expand, and improve our view of the universe. Well, there's one other topic I'll just touch on briefly. You've probably heard of dark energy. What is this all about? Well, since the beginning of the universe, in the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding. Some years back, two different teams chose to measure the expansion of the universe, the rate, how fast is it expanding, in particular, they wanted to measure the expansion rate at different periods in the history of the universe. In other words, today, of course, but much earlier, and perhaps all the way back, as far back as we could see. When they did that, they came to a startling conclusion. They had measured the type one supernovae and compared their distances and velocities at different points in time. What they found was that they had a greater distance than they should if the expansion was steady or constant. And you know, of course, if you travel a greater distance in your car in the same amount of time, surely you've been moving faster. And so it was that they realized that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It is faster today than it was in the past. So yet another example, of how our view of the universe has had to change here based on observations ultimately tied to light and using Einstein's theory. Okay, well, we've now again set up a very nice, I think background, a nice context with which to now examine our major topic this evening and that is the discovery of gravitational waves. Let me begin by saying the gravitational waves were initially proposed by Einstein himself. Now, he didn't think we'd ever necessarily be able to detect them because they are exceedingly weak. But his theory predicted that the motion of massive objects would literally generate waves of gravity. So this is really where it began. And you see a animation here showing two objects orbiting around each other. What's interesting about this, of course, is that the energy for these waves must come from somewhere. It simply can't appear and sure, certainly cannot either disappear. So where would the energy come from? Well, it would come from the orbital motion of these two objects. Well, let's take that one step further. If these two objects are losing orbital energy, they're gonna slowly, gradually spiral closer together. And as they do that, the laws of orbital motion dictate that it would take less time, a shorter period of time for them to orbit around each other, orbit around their center of mass. So in other words, the period of their orbit would decrease. Now, as far back as the 1970s, astronomers actually detected at least one system where they saw this. They didn't see the gravitational waves. We did not have the technology yet. But what they did see was a pair of stars orbiting each other. And if you look at my graph here in the lower right, the period of their orbit was decreasing exactly as the theory of relativity predicted. So again, it's an indirect type of evidence. We don't see the gravitational waves, but what we do see is their effect. As orbital energy was changed into gravitational waves, these two stars were gradually, slowly spiraling closer together, and the period of their orbit was being reduced. So this was a significant discovery. Astronomers felt excited, of course, to say, yeah, this really is occurring. Another, essentially, another test of Einstein's theory was being passed but we couldn't necessarily detect the waves themselves. It was then realized that really our best opportunity to detect these waves would be when, for example, these two objects would eventually merge together. There would be a much stronger burst of gravitational waves. And so scientists began thinking about how we might someday 
be able to detect that. Well, before I go too much further, let me go ahead and introduce the way we do detect these waves. Perhaps you've heard of the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories. Now they, of course, don't look like any observatory you've ever seen before that astronomers have used because they have a very different method, very different purpose in their work. But you notice on the right, the LIGO Washington and LIGO Louisiana facilities and the Virgo facility in Italy. These are currently our three primary gravitational wave observatories. I assure you that tremendous time, energy, and money went into the development, building, testing of these facilities. But we now have the ability to use them for gravita gravitational wave research. I want to tell you that um, sometime back, I happened to be watching a video I had recorded years ago, and it dealt with these facilities uh, just before they were being built and how the scientists were talking about it. So it's been very interesting for me to kind of watch that occur over the years and see this take shape and really come to life. So let's find out exactly how these work. And to do that, I'm going to use this animation. But before I begin it, let me give you a little explanation. What you're going to see here down in the lower left, this simple model, this cylinder is going to emit a beam of light, essentially laser light. And that small thin object in the middle is what we call a beam splitter. It's going to split the light into two identical beams. They're going to travel out some distance. Several kilometers are the length of the LIGO detectors. We're going to bounce off ultra precise and ultra smooth mirrors so that there's no distortion introduced there. It's very critical. And then they're going to come back to the beam splitter and be essentially merged back together down to the screen in the lower right. So the general idea here, the basic idea is that those two lengths, those two arms that the light must travel down must be exquisitely precisely the same distance. And when the light is merged back together, one of two things will happen. Normally, it will merge back together in a way that the scientists will realize nothing is occurring. But if a wave of gravity were to pass through each of these arms, you notice they're perpendicular, it's going to affect one more than the other. One of those arms is going to either lengthen or shorten a little bit more than the other. This is the critical, important measurement that they're after. What will happen is the light, as it's recombined, will not be perfectly collimated again. Instead, the scientists would see a little different version of that light, a little different signal, so to speak, in that screen. So let me put it into motion. As I just described, you see the light being sent down to each of those mirrors, bounce back. And if the length of the arms were to change, notice how the light signal changes. So let's watch a little more closely here as our light wave is split apart, sent down to bounce off the mirrors. And again, if the arms expand or contract, even in the slightest, they will be able to measure that difference. Notice here, for example, the two light waves, the yellow and the blue are what we call out of phase. But if those arms change, watch closely, they can go into phase. And this is exquisitely delicate measurement, but we now have the technology to do it. You can see again how the signal might change. It's just a idealized version here. So this is the general idea. As I said, it has been a very long, difficult, time-consuming, expensive road to building these facilities. And yet the scientific community stepped up, the funding was made available, the facilities have been built, tested, and are now in operation. They continue, of course, to be very carefully monitored for this exquisite work that must be done. So here is where the story gets even more exciting. As I mentioned to you, we expected that two massive objects spiraling together would give us this burst. Here you see an animation of two black holes. What would be more massive than that? As they spiral closer and closer, you'll see a burst of stronger gravitational waves. 
And this is what the scientists hope to detect. So this work went on in the early 21st century. Success was achieved in September of 2015. The first direct observation of gravitational waves matched perfectly with the prediction of general relativity. Here at the bottom left, you see the three primary scientists, although there were hundreds of others, Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, and Rainier Weiss. These men have dedicated their entire careers, really much of their lives, to the success of this accomplishment. They deserve great credit. As you're gonna see, they actually were awarded the Nobel Prize for this. So what do the squiggly lines mean on the right there? Well, in less than one second, two black holes merged and over three masses, three solar masses were converted into energy. This is an unimaginable amount of energy. As you can see here, 10 to the 49th watts. To give you some idea, our sun generates about 10 to the 26th watts. <laughs> so it's really hard to imagine how much energy this is. This is how much was changed into gravitational waves, matter, changed into energy, according to Einstein's theory. They call the resulting signal a chirp. You can see the little squiggly lines indicating that. This distorts that mirror spacing by less than 10 to the minus 18th meters. Again, hard to imagine the delicacy of such a measurement. It's less than 1,000, the diameter of an atomic nucleus change in one part in 10 to the 21st. As you're gonna see here, one of them say, no wonder it took so long <laughs> to be able to detect such a thing. So these gentlemen deserve so much credit for guiding this through many years, again, of development and construction and finally success. How about we get acquainted with these three gentlemen? We'll watch just a very short video clip in which the LIGO team discusses their work. And as I mentioned, these three were awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and observation of gravitational waves. Let's, uh, let's watch their story here. Waves were predicted by Einstein almost 100 years ago. A wave is a ripple in the fabric of space and time. It's produced somewhere in the distant universe and travels across the universe. When any massive object moves, it's changing the nature of space time. That's what Einstein told us. So you have a motion that stretches space in one direction and compresses space in the other direction. Nobody really believed at the time of the prediction that you could ever detect them because the size of the effect is so small. Was what we call a chirp and it was strong everybody thought it was a fluke it was too good and i thought my god this looks like it's it oh my gosh this is this is real it took us 25 years and two detectors to finally detect the gravitational wave we have interferometers one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana, to detect the stretching and compressing of space. We literally look for changes in the space-time distance in our instruments as the gravitational wave goes by. And the gravitational wave pushes them together and apart by one one thousandth diameter of the nucleus of an atom. No wonder it's taken so long <laughs> to pull this off. However, what's even more remarkable about this is what we detected. We have observed gravitational waves from two black holes forming a larger black hole. For the first time, two black holes spiraling together, coalescing, merging, creating wild oscillations, a storm in the fabric of space and time. They're moving at the velocity of light, damn near that velocity. 30 solar masses moving that fast. I mean, they're putting out incredible amounts of energy. And when they collide with one another, they produce a bigger black hole, but they also produce gravitational waves. And in that process, about three solar masses just disappears and goes into gravitational waves. Oh, 
it's going to be interesting. We have always said that this is going to be uh, a field called gravitational wave astronomy. Gravitational waves carry information that you can't get from any other way. A supernova, two neutron stars colliding, even the Big Bang itself, the beginning of the universe, all produce gravitational waves. First detection by LIGO is the very first step. It's just the start of the story nature is about to tell us. I would love to see Einstein's face. I mean, he would have been as dumbfounded as we are, because it's a wonderful proof that all of this incredible stuff, the strong field gravity, is in his equations. Just imagine that. To me, that's a miracle. So you can sense the excitement, the enthusiasm, the sense of accomplishment of this entire team. And it is a huge team of scientists that worked on this with these three in the lead. And of course, our congratulations go to them for such a momentous discovery. As you can start to sense, this is an entirely new way to view the universe. So let's get into a little bit more about that and see how that is the case. A few years after the initial discovery here in August of 2017, another event was detected. And this time it was determined that rather than two black holes, this was the merging of two neutron stars. These are pretty much the smallest, densest type of star. And when these collided, there was a little bit of a difference between the merger of the two black holes. Perhaps the most important thing was that light was generated. Unlike with the black holes, first a gamma ray burst, visible light, X-rays, ultraviolet across the spectrum. And astronomers had anticipated this and were ready. Many, many astronomers, hundreds of astronomers were waiting for this event when it was detected. They immediately turned their telescopes and made these observations in various wavelengths. So this in itself was a huge step forward in itself a very momentous observation to see the event, not only in gravitational waves, but in light, really became one of the most observed astronomical events ever. So great international collaboration. This became known as a kilonova. And I'll just mention briefly how, again, it has helped us expand our understanding, not only of gravitational waves, but ultimately of these objects. And one of the things that's come out of this is a much better understanding of the creation of heavy elements, the stuff you and me are made out of, our planet, our solar system. So astronomers had a pretty good idea how that all worked, but there were some gaps in our knowledge. Here we've begun to fill in the gaps. And that, of course, is what we want to do in science. So let's take a quick look here at a short little clip illustrating what this might have looked like up close, a kilonova merger of two neutron stars. Whoops, let me go back to that, sorry. Quite a dramatic uh, experience there, wasn't it? We can only imagine how that would have been up close. So what did we learn from that? Well, I began to mention that again, we determined that it was a new, two neutron stars merging together rather than black holes and thus the explosion of light as well. You look closely at these images and you see that light. Taken above with the Magellan telescope, you see that galaxy in which it's embedded and then the close-up view from below and this has, again, helped astronomers learn more about heavy elements, a little different process called neutron capture. I won't get into that right now. But the fact that we, again, have now seen events not only in gravitational waves, but at the same time in light and vice versa, this is now being called multi-messenger astronomy. In other words, we're seeing two different, entirely different views of these events. And we're hopeful that in time, this can lead us 
to many insights, one of which, as it says here, would be the independent measurement of the universe expansion rate. This could be a very huge discovery as well. Well, the very latest results were just released this past fall, a few months ago, the gravitational wave transit catalog number two, 39 additional events to add to the original 11 for now a total of 50. So you can start to sense this field is just beginning to mature a little bit. More and more events are being detected. We are adding to our number of events. And of course, we're going to learn so much. This graph on the right from my friend Aaron Geller at Northwestern, where there's quite a number of the astronomers working on gravitational waves begins to summarize some of these events. Notice the vertical axis, the mass of the various objects and down in the bottom, these would be neutron stars, one to two solar masses. But as some of those merge together, you can see they're gonna become black holes. And then as you get up above three to four to five solar masses, these are black holes. And as they merge together, they're gonna to make bigger black holes. So we're starting to see a population, so to speak, of these events. And if you realize that just in the last few years, we've already had 50 detections, you begin to realize they're not so rare as we might have thought. Different combinations of masses, some where the black holes are fairly equal in mass, some where they're very different. There were a couple notable discoveries in this data. Seven black holes resulted with more than 50 masses of the sun. Why is that significant? Well, up until then, we had not discovered black holes of that mass. Most stellar black holes are gonna be much less than that, perhaps five, 10 at most, something like that. But the fact that there were seven with greater than 50 solar masses is a new insight. We had suspected there may be these intermediate mass black holes. Now we've defined, now we've detected them. 26 of the 39 had spins indicating a common origin. In other words, their spin axes were aligned, which tells us they probably formed together long ago as very massive stars, but 13 of them did not. And so again, you begin to see a slow improvement, a slow growth here in our knowledge of this population of events. So what an exciting time to be involved in this type of research. As we've mentioned, our primary facilities in Washington and Louisiana, complemented by the Virgo Observatory in Italy, these were recently upgraded from their original capability. They actually came online in the early 2000s, but were not quite sensitive enough to detect these events. And so when they were upgraded, that resulted then in the actual detection, their sensitivity, their positional accuracy. And of course, the teams have learned to work together in collaboration. I will tell you that Japan's gravitational wave observatory, Kagura, just came online about a year ago at this time. It's not quite as sensitive as the other three, and they are still kind of working through the improvement of the facility, but that will be added to the collaboration here very shortly. And there is another observatory planned for LIGO India. So you can also see them separated here in longitude. The coverage around the earth will give us, again, not only improved sensitivity, but the ability to pinpoint the position of these events, these objects in space, and hopefully allow other astronomers to observe them as well. So what's the future hold for gravitational wave research? Well, to answer that, let's step back and kind of look at the big picture here for a moment of this whole spectrum of possible gravitational waves. Over in the, uh, towards the right in that blue region is where our current LIGO detectors can function. And you can see that they can detect, again, black hole mergers, supernova explosions, and other various things with gravitational waves of a certain period, or you might say wavelength. Well, I think you get the idea that it's far from all of them, isn't it? This vast spectrum of possible 
gravitational waves awaits our exploration. In the green shaded region, you see what is being proposed as a next generation of detector called LISA, and I'll get to that in just a second. But take one last quick look here at some of the objects that we may be able to observe in the future, we hope to, and really plan to. Supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. You heard one of them mention even the very early universe, shortly after the Big Bang, there was likely gravitational waves released. So this is almost as if we are back shortly after Galileo invented his telescope and began to see things no one had seen before. Can he imagine what our telescopes can do today? Well, this is kind of where we are with gravitational wave astronomy right now. It's just shortly after detection, but we're gonna expand that to other, again, wave periods or wavelengths. And let me go ahead and show you how we're gonna do that using LISA here. So LISA is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. Get this, a proposed gravitational wave observatory of three spacecraft separated by over two and a half million kilometers. Now you may know that the distance from the Earth to the moon is only less than half a million kilometers. So this will be an enormous array of these three spacecraft. They will need to be maintained in very close, precise formation in order to do their work. But such an enormous size will enable them to detect gravity waves of much longer wavelength, much longer wave period than anything here on Earth. And so they'll be able to detect, again, very different gravitational waves earlier and sooner than we will here on Earth. This will be a next step, a excellent complement to the Earth-based gravitational wave detectors. LISA, we hope, will be the one that will enable us to make this independent measurement of the expansion of the universe. Perhaps you've heard of the Hubble parameter H sub zero. You might have heard recently, we've got two current ways to measure that. And for whatever reason, those two numbers do not agree so well. There's a bit of uncertainty about what's going on here. Scientists love a good mystery. And we have one here with the expansion rate of the universe. So we'd love to bring in a third independent way to measure this expansion parameter and understand better uh, the expansion and history of our universe. So I can tell you that although this is still kind of on the drawing board, so to speak, there was a technology demonstration already performed by putting much smaller uh, technology, the mirrors themselves into space and beginning to test out the technology needed to make this happen. So scientists are very hopeful that in the next oh, 5, 10, 15 years, this project will move forward and give us another big step forward, gravitational wave astronomy. Well, we have come a long way in our discussion here this evening, haven't we? Why does this matter? Some people might think that's very cool that scientists love to do this, but really, why are we spending all this money? Where's this going? I'd like to conclude with a few comments about that question. Number one, you can see here, the very first reason. Humans simply want to understand the universe. We want to know, that's in our nature. We've always been curious. We've always been explorers. And it has led us so far, of course. Number two, I think most people would agree that advances in scientific understanding have led to other discoveries. Let me just touch on a couple that we anticipate. When you think about gravitational waves, how gravity, again, is a property of matter. And as matter is changed into gravitational waves, this, in a sense, we could say may allow us in the future to literally not only understand better, but to kind of see inside these objects, so to speak. We don't know what form that may take, but it is a very tantalizing idea that it may give us the ability to do something like that. That second bullet there, these primordial gravitational waves from the beginning of the universe. I won't get into this in detail, but if you're familiar with this, it, it might sound familiar. Immediately after the Big Bang, space itself had very tiny little fluctuations called quantum fluctuations. 
And then we are pretty sure there was a burst of expansion called inflation. And this may have generated gravitational waves that are still visible, still imprinted, so to speak, on what we call the cosmic microwave background. I know I'm getting a bit technical here. Some of you may be familiar with that CMB. The CMB, what we see of it today is the farthest back we can possibly look. This is when the universe became transparent to light. This is as far back as we'll ever be able to see with light. It's about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Well, scientists would love to look back farther. We have some pretty good theories of what occurred before that, but we'd love to confirm those theories by making actual observations of gravitational waves imprinted on the cosmic microwave background. That may be possible in the future. Well, again, some may say that's all very good. And again, scientists love this kind of thing, but what does it mean for me? You see again, our progression there along the bottom from the early philosophers through the scientific revolution of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, Newton's theory, Einstein's theory. What does it mean to most everyday people? Are there any practical benefits? To answer that, let me use an example that I like to share with my students sometimes. Let's go back in our minds, visualize the early to maybe mid 19th century or even before that. We didn't have a lot of technology, did we? People lived in their simple homes, but there was this one guy named Edison and he had this idea he was experimenting with electricity as a number of scientists were. And it was more of a scientific curiosity to most people. They didn't know what he was doing. It had no effect on their life, but think about the advances that resulted from that. You can see again, I tried to illustrate this. People were carrying candles around in their homes and Edison said, you know, I got this better idea. Maybe I'll make this light bulb thing. Now, people might have thought, well, why do you want to do all that? We, you know, candles work fine, but really they didn't. <laughs> Think about the coming advances. Let me walk you through a couple of those that resulted from Edison and others experimenting with electricity. People like Maxwell, Faraday, maybe you know some of those names. Okay. So Edison invents the light bulb after numerous failures. Well, that technology led in the early 20th century to the invention of some new thing called the radio. Maybe you've heard of it. And this was amazing at the time. In other words, someone could sit at a device and speak into it and almost magically their voice would be transmitted miles away to someone else with a device who could hear them. This was technology. This was an amazing advance based on electricity. Well, you can see the story here where I'm going. It wasn't but a couple more decades before we now encoded video information. We developed cameras, motion picture cameras that could take that video, transfer it into a electronic signal, transmit it invisibly, almost magically through the air to people's homes. They could watch others speaking without ever being near them. This was an amazing uh, invention in the 1940s, 1950s. Of course, every American home had to have one or more. And from there on, some of you may even remember as far back as when that technology led to computers. Those were originally huge devices at large institutions, but now everybody could have a computer in their home. And I think you know where that's led. Now we all walk around with a computer in our hands, in our pockets, don't we? We have more computing power on our cell phones than the whole world had a few decades ago. And ultimately, of course, the internet. I don't have to talk about the power of the internet, how it has connected the world together. It has allowed so much communication in so many ways. So my point of all that is, yes, basic or what we can call pure research does matter. We don't often know where it will lead, but that's the point. We need to follow it. We need to pursue it. Look at how far we've come in just the last 150 years with electricity. 
Had those early scientists not experiment with it, we would not have all of these advances that we do today. So I think you can see again, when you take that idea, that concept back to science in general, how important that is. You take that back to a little bit more specifically, perhaps astronomy now, this idea of gravitational wave astronomy, where that might lead us, we don't know. Well, in conclusion, let me just sum up a couple of thoughts then. We've seen how humans have always, again, wanted to understand the universe. At first, when we didn't have much technology, we turned to reason. But by the, again, Middle Ages, the scientific revolution, the scientific method was developed, and it has proven, as I said, to be a very powerful, perhaps our most powerful tool to explore and understand the universe. We saw how much we learned by analyzing light. I didn't have the time tonight to go into much more detail, but I think that all gave us, as I intended, the background, really the context in which to now view this new discovery of gravitational waves. It truly is a new way to view the universe. So I'll simply leave you with that question. Where will it lead? Time will tell, but surely we must follow. So thank you very much for being with me tonight. I enjoyed that. We're gonna take a short break here and answer a few questions. Before we do that, I'll just remind you that if you enjoyed my presentation tonight, there's other ones out on YouTube that you can find. Some of you have been in attendance to those, so nice to have you back. Whether it is extrasolar planets, Spitzer Space Telescope, black holes, a number of them out there. I'm always curious in what topics you may like to hear about. Got a few ideas myself. And if you'd like to go a little further even, maybe you don't have the time to attend classes, but I do have some short, brief courses set up on the internet as well. One for solar system astronomy, one for stars and galaxies. Here at your convenience, you can watch short 15 to 30 minute videos on a number of topics in those areas. So thank you again for being with us tonight. We appreciate you supporting CODs STEM in our series. I'll turn it back to Julie for just a moment here and then we'll get ready to take some questions. Thank you again, Joe. Just as a quick reminder, uh, you can use the Q&A feature um, in this webinar to ask your question of Joe, and then we'll try to get to as many as we can tonight. I'll take a look at the questions here. Oh boy, we got a few coming in. All right, let me just glance through these for a moment. Maybe I'll pick out a few of those. Okay. All right, let me start with uh, one of our first ones here. It looks like it's a little more related to the idea of dark energy. And the question is from, is from Trixie. Why do we think it's the expansion rate is accelerating? That seems counterintuitive. And it does seem counterintuitive, doesn't it? If you had asked astronomers 25 years ago, we would have all said, yeah, that can't happen. So I, as well as pretty much any astronomer was shocked when that was announced. Even the teams that discover it were shocked. So ultimately it comes down to these teams made very certain, both teams, to both independent teams, to be sure of their results before they even announced it. Of course, this was extremely well vetted by the entire astronomical community. And as they like to say, it simply won't go away. So the point becomes now we have to explain it. And kind of, I guess my short answer would be that there are a number of different possibilities for what is causing this. It is clearly some type of energy that is pushing the universe apart faster over time, thus the generic term dark energy. Um, I'll just throw one at you briefly here. It's thought that down at the very, very, very lowest, smallest scales, space and matter are not perfectly smooth, literally. There is uh, ways to kind of get around <laughs> the conservation of energy, if you're familiar with that concept. In other words, there's what are called particles, virtual particles, that literally can appear out of nothingness if a particle and its antiparticle appear and then disappear quickly enough to avoid getting caught, so to speak. And it's thought that when this occurs, they may give a very tiny little push a very tiny little expansion to space-time. 
and then pop back out and disappear. So I know it sounds like we're kind of making that up. Frankly, this is at that stage where we're throwing hypotheses out on the table, so to speak, and trying to test them out. Time will tell. Right now, some of the, the best astronomers are really thinking about what other possibilities there may be for that. Interestingly, these possibilities are allowed by Einstein's theory. And they also start to bring in the other major theory of physics called quantum mechanics. So this is an exciting opportunity even. We think this is telling us something about the universe that's gonna help us kind of um, coordinate or what's the right word I'm looking for here, put together these two theories. Up till now, we've had a hard time with relativity on the large scale, quantum mechanics on the very small scale, how can we harmonize those? We've had trouble with that, but we think maybe this may be a clue that may help us. All right, so thank you for your question. Let's take another one here. I'm gonna take one from my friend Gary Zentara out in New Mexico. Some of you may have seen some of his amazing astrophotos. My goodness, if you haven't, I'll be glad to share a few of those. But Gary simply asked what kind of heavy elements were produced in the neutron star merger, the kilonova. I don't know the exact details on that, Gary. I do know that there are elements that we've had a hard time explaining before, things like uranium and plutonium. It seems like those are very hard to create in a well-understood supernova, but it seems like these are the type of elements that may well be produced, again, in these kilonova. So that's an exciting um, step forward, again, to kind of kind of fill in part of our gap uh, in that particular area. Let me go back to a question here by Sarah Kimber. The Hubble parameter, maybe I went over that a little bit more quickly than I, I could have. The Hubble parameter essentially is telling us that at a certain distance from Earth, a galaxy is receding from Earth at a certain velocity. And you'll hear the units sometimes vary, but generally we'll say, well, at a distance of this many megaparsecs, megaparsec is several million light years, the velocity would be this much, whatever that might be, um, 100 kilometers per second or 200 or 300. So you would think if the universe is expanding at a steady rate, that it would be exactly that. If you were to plot this out, you'd get a nice straight line. And for the most part, that's true. It's not like it's a wildly different value, but again, as these teams noted in the early universe, that graph curved a little bit. In other words, what it's really telling us is not so much the early universe expanding faster, it's us today. The universe today is expanding faster than it was by a little bit in the past. So the Hubble parameter measures the expansion rate or velocity at different times. It's not perfectly uniform all the way up there, up till, till today, okay? Let's see what else. Got a few compliments, so thank you very much. I do try to provide you guys with a nice discussion on different topics. There's a few little more technical questions here. The process is used by LIGO and Virgo to locate the source. My friend Mario, good question. Didn't really cover that so well. When we observe a event of really any kind, type from different positions or different locations, Sometimes you hear this term we use in everyday language, we kind of triangulate, if you've heard that term. Astronomers may use different terminology for it. But if we view an object or an event from two different positions or locations, we get a little different perspective, don't we? And in some ways, it can be likened to, again, triangulating and saying, well, if we essentially kind of drew a virtual triangle, so to speak, we would get a better understanding, better positional location of that particular event or object. So the idea here is by having two facilities, LIGO in Washington, one in Louisiana, you got two different perspectives. And essentially it's quite complex, it's quite uh, difficult, but they essentially can use that. Think about the curvature of the earth, think of the positioning of the arms. So these detectors are three-dimensionally in very different orientations and it takes quite a bit of sophisticated analysis, but they can essentially use them to get a different perspective on the same event and get us a better positional fix. I believe that was your question. I hope 
and that was the answer you were looking for. Okay, so let me see what else we got here. My old friend Joe Malik, nice to have you back with us tonight. How do astronomers know the cause of the gravity waves? That's complicated. <laughs> I won't pretend to understand every little detail. Uh, but essentially, the idea here is, again, uh, general relativity shows that matter can be changed into energy at its, at its simplest explanation. I think that's our best bet. You know that in stars, in the center, matter is changed into energy during the process called nuclear fusion. Now, only a small amount of the matter changes into energy, but it's enough to power the sun and other stars. Well, here we have a much greater a much more powerful process, so to speak, where the matter itself in its entirety is changed into the energy of gravitational waves. So I guess the short answer would again be that during the merger of the black holes, there's a lot of very, very complex physics going on to cause that to happen. Space time itself, as I think you heard one of the scientists, he liked to use that term. He said it's almost like a, almost like a storm in space. I kind of think that's a nice descriptive way to say what's happening here. The merger itself results in this change from matter into energy. Okay, let's see if we can take one or two more here. Okay. Let's just see if there's one more. Let's take this one last one here. From Terry Brady, an interesting question here about the gravitational constant G. See that in the equation, we kind of take that for granted. It's actually a very small number because frankly, gravity is the weakest of all the natural forces we know of, the four primary forces. Is it possible G has not been constant over the life of the universe? That is a fascinating question, the type that scientists probably lose sleep over sometimes. Could it somehow be related could it be a function of the changing expansion rate? And often scientists begin by saying, well, many things are possible. We maybe can't answer that yet. We don't know that. But that's one of those questions that leads us now to want to test the idea. In other words, that could almost be viewed as a hypothesis. And the next step would be for scientists to say, yeah, how would we test that? Well, how could we measure G at different times in the universe? Would we see this effect or this effect or that effect. I'm not aware of anyone pursuing that, but I will mention something that I think is related to this. The discovery of dark matter, several decades now we have been searching for what dark matter is. It's extremely elusive, very difficult to kind of get our hands on it and say, well, it's this or it's that. You might know right now where the thinking is it's probably a particle, but there are some scientists who rightfully so have raised alternative explanations for what we've observed. This is how science works. And one of those is similar to what you're describing here. It's called modified Newtonian dynamics, if you want to look that up. And basically what they're saying is exactly that. Maybe not so much over the life of the universe that gravity changes, but their thought is at great scales. In other words, on very large scales, would gravity perhaps change a little bit? And so again, it's fair for them to propose an alternative explanation. Once again, that needs to be tested. They have had many discussions already. I will tell you that the vast majority of the astronomical community has not adopted their explanation, but it hasn't completely gone away. It's been raised again recently because of the difficulty in putting our finger on that. So to answer your question, many things are possible. It may be that future research could turn something up like that. We don't know. Right now, the consensus is it is unlikely. But if G had changed over the life of the universe, I will tell you this, that would have a great effect on stars. Stellar fusion would not be possible if it had changed very much. We would not be looking back into the distant ancient universe or I should say it the other way on the early universe and seeing stars. So that in itself, I think probably is telling us, no, G has been very stable 
but I guess time will tell. Well, thank you very much for those. There's a couple more I won't go into right now, but very thought provoking. Hope you enjoyed our presentation. And uh, yes, we will plan to get back together again in the fall. So hope you'll join me. And in the meanwhile, again, please take time to enjoy some of the presentations out on YouTube. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and a nice weekend. And hope to see you again soon.